podcast and then we're going to do uh, live on Facebook and give folks a few moments to get logged in uh, as we're doing this. getting us set up on the um, all the live sources to make sure we're ready to go and giving folks again, like I said, a couple of seconds to get logged in. Um, there we go. All right. I need to get somebody while I'm doing all of these to set up a camera back here so they can capture all of the madness that is happening in front of me to make all of this happen. <laughs> so I need to do that at some point in time and see how that looks. Uh, yes. So thank y'all for taking time to uh, to join us this morning. Um, We'll go ahead and get started, and and um, if folks join us uh, on the live call, uh, we'll certainly um, uh, let folks know about the um, ways to answer or ask questions, and, and you guys will see those pop up as well as we're going through them. Uh, and then we, uh, as we're on Facebook Live, I'll, I'll try to get as many of those questions, if there are, are any, uh, to you, uh, and then we'll put them together uh, after the call and send out some responses as needed as well. So thank you all again for... Uh, for joining us today. Um, so thank you for those of you who are going to be watching this and those who may be uh, watching now. Um, we we're, we're started this series a couple of weeks ago talking about the church's response to crisis, and we started out looking at how uh, metropolitan community churches specifically had worked with and through the AIDS crisis and, and the ways in which that um, that they were able to manage that and what we learned from that and what we can apply to today. And that sparked a series of conversations that, that have led us uh, to, to making sure that we're getting information out there about what we're doing, what we can be doing, because I think many of us find ourselves wanting to do something. We're called to action, but we find ourselves asking, what is it that we need to best do? So we wanted to make sure we had an opportunity to talk with folks and, and share with folks what we're, uh, what we know uh, or what we um think is the best thing for us to do in the moment. So we're joined this morning by uh, Dr. Ernest Grant, who is the president of the American Nurses Association, uh, and also joined by Dr. David Williams, who is the division chief of emergency services and trauma in New Jersey. Uh, and what hospital system are you with, uh, Dr. David? I'm sorry. RWJ Barnabas. There we go, RWJ Barnabas. Um, so thank you all for, for taking time to be with us this morning. Um, we've got a lot of information that we're going to try and cover in this next hour uh, that really will try to get some fact out there about what's going on uh, and what we can do and, and just facts about COVID-19. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to, to the two of you and let you kind of guide us through what you've already uh, gotten prepared for us this morning. And then uh, we may ask some questions and, and folks are uh, invited to ask questions throughout the presentation. So. Dr. Grant and Dr. Williams, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, I think uh, David has a uh, uh, the introductory portion, so we'll let him uh, go first. Good morning, folks. Glad you were able to join us. We're going to talk about COVID-19 and um, actually some of the myths and the actual versus facts and just some medical info. It may get a little bit technical, but we're going to keep it as simple as we can. Now, going, to, going back to my church roots, I'm also the pastor of MCC Christ Liberator here in New Jersey. So one of the things that has been, keeps me going throughout this, um, I've been working on the past 30 days, nonstop on COVID-19 and treating, testing, you name it, ICU, you name it, we've been there. One of the things that scriptures that basically reminds me a lot of times that gives me the strength to keep going is in Timoth Second Timothy one verse seven, which says, For God do, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but rather a spirit of power, 
enough love, enough self-discipline. In other words, a sound mind. Scripture is not talking about self-preservation in the face of an immediate threat or danger. It is calling the believer to remember who they are and not be lacking in self-assurance or courage, the mental or moral strength to venture, persevere, and withstand danger. Timothy was being called to know who he was and what he believed so he could respond appropriately. That being said, I'll put, the, put this out there for you. The basic problem or how COVID-19 acts is that it causes the cell damage, which triggers the immune response, which can show up in uh, various patients as inflammation, fever, or, and mucus production. Right. I'm sorry. So, one of the things that we probably should look at in um, COVID-19, there's something I'm going to talk about. Here comes the first scientific term here, a zoonotic effect. Mm -hmm. What that means is that you, how the COVID-19, or which is a coronavirus, got to the human beings is that it started out in an animal reservoir, most 10 chances to one, a bat. That bat, um, that virus in that reservoir went to an intermediate host, which is in this instance, a pangolin. Never heard of the animal before this, but it got in there and, which is something, the pangolin, its scales, it's a um, used mostly in the Far East. The scales are highly sought after for its medicinal effect. The virus was in there, it, got, it was consumed, got into the human um, body. COVID-19, the actual acronym is SARS-Corona, COVID-2, which is basically COV-2, which means it's another version of the SARS mm. uh, coronavirus that started out in 2002, when we had the first pandemic, or mini pandemic. And this is now the second coming of it in a mutated form. The zoonotic effect is the ability of a virus to go from one totally isolated um, source to end up into human beings where it's totally adapted to it. One of the other things I'm gonna look at here, we're just gonna talk about three epidemiology terms here and the ones, one is a case more mortality rate. Mm -hmm. All they heard about this a lot of times when um, that basically how that is defined is you take the number of deaths divided by the number of positive cases and multiplied by 100. The case morbidity rate for the coronavirus is as of today and it is, four, is around 4%. But if you look around the United States, you will see that it has something like a 6.3% in Michigan. Here in New Jersey, I, it is at five. New York City has, New York, the state of New York has it in of itself has a one around 5.3. We'll see that it has. And it goes, it fluctuates. Well, Italy had, a, I think, their uh, case morbidity rate was around 10%. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that we should look at um, next is that I'll be sharing my screen here, is inference to influenza and, um, and COVID-19. Now, we're going to talk about something called the r North, which is the re reproductive ratio. The reproductive ratio is the degree of spreadability. COVID-19 has an R naught of two to three, so pretty much around three. So that means that for each person that gets infected with COVID-19, that person will infect three people. Those three people in turn will infect nine. If this is the case, you'll see it's an exponential. So if you take it further, those nine will infect 27, that 27 will infect 81 and so forth, and it just builds from there. Mm -hmm. Whereby when you look at the flu, 
the, the common cold, the common influenza, it R naught is 1.3, and that means it does one to one. Each person just infects one person, and it's pretty much a flat line when you look across the board. So if you look at, if you're supposed to graph it with the R O, the R naught on this axis here, you'll see that you're going to have, the. you always hear people about flattening the curve. That curve actually is the reproductive ratio. Here is what COVID looks like. It looks of, of R naught that is greater than one. Influenza has a R naught of one. So how do we decrease the R naught or the spreadability? We quarantine, cell quarantine, stay out of large crowds, washing their hands. So that way we remove a lot of the infectious particles out of the general population. And in so term, you reduce the amount of people getting infected. Hence, you talk about flattening the curve right here. So that's what they talk about, flattening the curve. That is how this actually comes into effect. The next thing we're going to talk about quickly is something called the SI, which is the serious interval. And this is defined as a period where symptoms start in a patient, patient one, to the start of symptoms in patient two. So COVID has a SI, a serious interval of five to 7.5 days, influenza as a SI of two to 2.5 days. Hence, in layman's language, it means that COVID will infect, you'll start showing symptoms about five, five days 7.7 .7 and a half days max, you'll start showing symptoms of the infection, whereby in influenza, you'll see it in two to two and a half days. So if you take patient one, which is, I'm going to X1 here, and after five days, the symptoms start. Symptoms will end at 14 days out. Now, you get that patient one infects patient two. So their time starts here where they have the five day wait and then the symptoms start here. So the SI is gonna be period of time from infection between patient one and patient two. And that is right here, it's a, we're putting it about five to 7.5 days. For these purposes, it's most likely five. Now, we're glad that this is uh, five days because it's a larger um, SI. Because if we had done the SI for the influenza, you'd now have this here would actually become a nightmare because we'd have a whole lot of people getting infected a lot quicker and it would have been pretty much uncontrollable. It's somewhat uncontrollable right now as it is with the higher SI. So that's just how the epidemiology, some of how COVID-19 works. Okay. So I'm gonna turn this over to Ernie to, and uh, we're gonna have a discussion around end of life issues and some of the best practices associated with it. Thank you, David. Um, so when we talk about, uh, one of the things that's been uh, in the news quite a lot uh, with uh, this virus is we know that it has the tendency to be very fatal in certain populations, that being older adults, uh, people with comorbidities such as uh, hypertension, diabetes, asthma, um, you know, things of this sort. Um, and so as a result of that, when they contract uh, the, the virus, then uh, the body is being pulled in multiple directions. It's already being pulled in that way just to manage or maintain, um, you know, the diabetes and hypertension and things that they may have. But now that the uh, virus has invaded the body, it creates an even uh, uh, bigger stress and strain on the body. And so uh, those uh, individuals who are, are older, who have a lowered immune system, uh, etc. They find it, uh, you know, very difficult to, um, you know, to fight off this virus. And as a result of that, uh, you see death uh, happening. And death happens uh, sometimes very, very quickly within about 24 hours of, um, of it being infected. 
through several days. Um, it, uh, again, it will vary by each individual and what their prior state of health may have been uh, before contracting the virus. As a result of that though, and somewhat similar as uh, we have seen with uh, individuals who uh, back in the early days when, uh, when AIDS was becoming uh, you know, very prominent and we didn't quite understand that yet, there were those end of life issues that needed to be discussed, such as um, you know, having the talk with your family or friends about uh, you know, if I contract uh, this, uh, this virus, what are some of the things that I want to make uh, certain is done? Uh, where are my important papers being kept or who needs to be notified? Um, you know, perhaps uh, I need to update my insurance policy, making sure that, uh, you know, the, um, the identified beneficiary is the person that I want it to be. In some cases, we don't even think about that under normal circumstances, uh, but I've seen very often where you may have uh, listed someone as a beneficiary, say your, your parents, and your parents have been dead for a number of years, but you never changed the, the beneficiary on, on the policy. Well, uh, because their name is on it, it's gonna make it very, very difficult for someone to, you know, to get the, uh, the funds. Uh, literally, they have to almost go to court uh, and et cetera to, uh, uh, in order to make certain that the, uh, the check or the beneficiary check is made out to them as opposed to the person who's already deceased on there as the, uh, the beneficiary. Um, so it is a very uh, difficult conversation to have. Uh, I know I've had uh, three very close colleagues, um, you know, to me that have contracted this virus and they were very young actually, 25 and 27 years of age, but still because of the acuteness of the illness and uh, you know, it made them also stop and think that, uh, you know, uh, that I may die from this and do I need to have that conversation with my family and uh, make sure that uh, the wishes that I have are, uh, you know, are carried out. And that is something that we, we do need to think about, such as preparing a will and, as I said, making certain that everyone understands what your, your wishes are, that they know where your papers are, uh, your important papers, not only your will or insurance papers, but um, anything else, such as if you're working, uh, you know, your, uh, uh, your retirement benefits, or if you have a 401k or your bank account, uh, you know, numbers, all those are important things that perhaps we don't uh, necessarily think about, but it is something, particularly given how fast this virus can overtake the body and you uh, perhaps may succumb to this illness is extremely important that you, uh, you, know, you have the stuff written out or, and, and given to um, you know, a very close friend or family member, particularly if you live alone and, um, you know, and, and no one may know where your important papers and things may be. Or if you have a safe deposit box, uh, you know, how to uh, you know, get access to that and, and even just the location, you know, which bank might that safe deposit box be, uh, you know, be, be located or some of the things to think about as well. So, and then also, um, you know, have a discussion with a family member or friend about your healthcare uh, proxy. You know, what do you want done? Uh, you know, in the event that you wind up on a ventilator and, uh, you know, do you want to be uh, on a ventilator? Or if your heart should stop, do you want heroic measures done to, um, you know, in order to try to revive you, or based on you know the, the various situations, uh, again, just making sure that everyone knows what your wishes are, and so that you will uh, make sure that they are carried out. That is having that healthcare advocate, uh, so to speak, uh, so that every uh, you know all of the, all the things that you want to have done are carried out uh, you know properly. And I don't know, David, if you have anything else that you'd like to, to add to that before we perhaps talk a little bit more about. Uh, uh, some of the comorbidities and et cetera, and why this virus is so detrimental. I have okay. a, a question for you, Dr. Grant and Dr. Williams, if, if y'all would. Uh, I know just from previous experience that um, when you're at an end of life care situation, oftentimes uh, physicians would step out and speak to the family to find out what the wishes are. Um, and now I'm imagining that that one-on-one uh, -on -one contact is much different today and, and sometimes not able to be had. So does that increase the importance of having those documents in place so that the wishes are known to the healthcare staff up front? 
uh, because the family's not going to have a chance in some cases to be able to express those at the time of care. Yes, unfortunately, I'm going to say yes, that happened because right now as it stands, there a next of kin, but if there is no directive there and that person is not present, it's mm -hmm. not so particularly the attending physician, in this case me, to mm -hmm. make a determination of what next to do. Mm -hmm. That puts the doctor um, or the clinician in a rather precarious um, <laughs> ethical situation. Do you discontinue the person off or at least what point is enough? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, this has gone on far enough or do you keep going? And at some point, you do have to make that decision um, where you fall sometimes hear, hear about a DNAR, which has now become a more um, thing, more, more prominent in this day and age, which is uh, do not attempt resuscitation. And that basically will come from uh, the doctor, the attending physician in charge, where it says, okay, we get to this point. There is a, it's a triage of sorts. And it's a rough place to be. Yeah. I tell you that every time to make that decision because you also have the other part of it where I go from a doctor where a lot of people in the ICU are dying alone. So it's either a nurse is holding their hand while they're holding, the nurse is holding their hand and a respiratory tech is trying to disconnect the ventilator. I now have to switch into the role of doing a minister of doing the prayers for the dying because these people are dying by themselves. So a lot of times it'd be nice to know because you're just assuming it was a generic prayer that this person is. And I have a colleague who's a, um, a rabbi, so at least you take care of that along the Muslim faith. I just do what I did during the, there's, during the Gulf War. You basically do the, a Muslim prayer and call it that because you're the only person there. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, to answer your question, it'd be nice to have a healthcare proxy with a, or an advanced directive so you know exactly where, how to proceed and when to proceed. I would, would also just add to that, Vance, very quickly that uh, in the, I guess for lack of a better term, normal situation, the family member is there, you know, maybe, or a friend is there. They can look in the room, they can see all the equipment and such, and and sort of begin to, you know, to picture or, or rationalize, you know, what, uh, you know, the healthcare providers when we're speaking with them about the end of life issues. In this particular case, though, the family member or close friend is totally removed from the healthcare setting. So, um, you know, so you're just listening or hearing what maybe uh, told to you over the phone, even though you may be FaceTiming them and perhaps can turn the phone to so that they can see all that environment. It is um, a little bit different. So, um, uh, you know, seeing it with your own eyes and being able to, uh, you know, to take in what is being told to you and to make a, a rational decision that way is one thing as opposed to just hearing it over the phone and uh, and, and plus it, it being so all of a sudden, uh, you know, in, in some cases also. So that's why it is very important that we do have that conversation. Yes. So I think we we're going to talk about maybe the, uh, the, the correlation of, uh, of the comorbidity, such as hypertension, asthma, mm -hmm. you know, things like this, and why the COVID-19 infection, uh, you know, just really fulminates from, from there. So, uh, David, I don't know if you had any... Uh, yeah. Into Just uh, again, let's start with one of the comorbidities, heart disease. And heart disease, I'm going to throw in there hypertension as well. What makes COVID such an interesting um, a virus is that where it attacks the lungs, it attacks the lungs in uh, something called the alveoli, which is little sacs, little cells in the lungs that basically are responsible for absorbing oxygen. The receptor, this is the place where the virus actually attaches to the cell, is uh, where an enzyme called ACE, and I'm not even going to, because as acetylcholine so um, tenant expressive, expressive gene, this is where ACE, so you ever hear people talk about the ACE inhibitor, this is what they're talking about. 
Well, the virus now is competing with the, your own body for that receptor, and the virus 10 chances wins. And it does that, it goes in the system, so therefore your control of your blood pressure goes up. Um, this is now, your body's immune system is now weakened, and it puts additional strain on the body's metabolic um, systems. Stressing, it starts stressing out the already weakened heart, and it makes the lungs harder to oxygen, oxygenate the blood. And this further puts uh, further stresses on our heart. So sometimes you may, if you're in here at the hospital, you'll see here us talking about the person that tired out. It basically means that something, the act of breathing that you and I actually are so used to having is uh, without even thinking about it, has become so difficult that the person gets tired from just breathing. And that's where you're going to have to step in to assist with a ventilator. And this it also causes inflammation uh, caused by an inf infection to the lining of the blood vessels. So again, you have heart damage, right, left, and center going on. Ernie, you have anything to add on that piece? Um, no, I, I think you pretty well covered it very well. Just, uh, just I, I guess, very basically for the people to know is that the virus is competing against uh, the other, um, you know, natural or um, uh, things that the, the body would be using and the virus wins, uh, you know, nine times out of 10. It is uh, uh, when it's gotten to be that, uh, you know, into that stage and very, very permanent. Um, yes, it, it is going to essentially just take over the, the, the body that way. Okay, and then we'll talk about respiratory diseases. Now, this is, again, something that comes up um, in this in this fight. One of them is asthma, pulmonary hypertension, and which are diseases um, of the airway on other parts of the lungs. With the CR, we call, call these things CRDs, chronic respiratory diseases. Um, people with CRDs need to be especially vigilant about the coronavirus because of the possible complications of pneumonia. Pneumonia compromises the lung, which brings oxygen to the body. One of the big reasons why we say be careful of these people should be very careful and protect themselves at all costs because this is the complications they're setting themselves up for. Then we move to diabetes. Everybody's asking, like, okay, how does diabetes put you at risk? Well, coronavirus is even more especially dangerous for diabetics. People with, diabet with uh, diabetes have heightened levels of inflammation throughout their bodies which is another risk factor. If you have a viral infection, this then can turn into pneumonia easier because diabetes itself is an inflammatory disease. It's also important to note that when a person has diabetes, episodes of stress like a viral infection can increase the blood sugar levels, which can also lead to complication. So you now have heart disease, chronic respiratory dis um, disease and diabetes. All of these come together. And particularly when you look in the news, you hear that a lot of African-Americans are being affected by this. This is one of the reasons, because these are daily comorbidities or daily disease um, occurrences in the lives of many African-Americans, either particularly amongst young uh, black males Asthma is more prevalent. Mm -hmm. Diabetes, heart disease, hypertension. All of these roll in together. You now have, you're more susceptible to this. If you add in now, in an immunocompromised patient, somebody's HIV positive. Now let's a note on that. Somebody's HIV positive and undetectable and taking their ARVs, taking their medications as prescribed, and the T cell levels are up. In this instance, we somewhat treat them as a healthy person for the most part, because for the most part, you have normalized their immune system to the best extent possible. Mm -hmm. 
a good idea for them to get infected, but we don't really look at them as this is the person that's going to be immediately infected. What we do look out for is the person of those who people who have not been tested for HIV, who have a high, heightened levels of viral load, which is off the charts, no treatment whatsoever. So now their immune system is um, destroyed or, and weakened already. Add this to it, it's not a good cocktail because now you're trying, you have two similar viruses, coronavirus, when I say similar, coronavirus versus a rhinovirus, sorry, a retrovirus, coronavirus versus a retrovirus competing for the same resources as your body itself, as your cells. So it's a three-way fight. And guess who is going to be the first person? Mm. So that's one of the reasons there. OK. Um, Dave Dishman asked a question, if we can uh, interject this really quickly. Uh, how does this affect uh, or impact people that are living with Parkinson's? Again, look at the weakened immune system mm -hmm. where there is, um, your nerves are not, your control, your motor functions are not completely there. So therefore, you're already having to compensate for your, to do what you need to do. And then suddenly you bring this virus in that now weakens the heart weakens the level of um, oxygen that goes, that is put in the blood. And of course, the more hypoxic you get, meaning lack of oxygen, the less control you have and, and of your motor skills, etc. So that's a possible way of looking okay. at it. Okay. Um, All right. Um, so one of the other um, items that we'd like to uh, talk about, since we're, you know, we're got uh, <laughs> a lot to talk about in a short amount of time, uh, is uh, some of the um, perceived uh, stigma uh, associated or discrimination associated with, uh, with this virus as well. And again, somewhat similar uh, back when uh, AIDS was first um, uh, being uh, diagnosed and, uh, you know, and uh, being discussed in the public. Um, uh, there was a lot of discrimination that uh, that went on, and of course, we're hearing now of a lot of discrimination and mistreatment of uh, not only African Americans but uh, you know people of Asian descent as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of that could be uh, fueled by you know the title that has been used a lot is you know the Chinese virus, mm -hmm. um, you know, and of course now I'm also hearing that. Um, uh, a lot of uh, you know, African Americans perhaps are being denied service in some areas of the country and the globe uh, because of the you know the fear now you know with the, the word getting out that it is very prominent uh, or that uh, blacks are dying from uh, this uh, uh, infection more than uh, uh, than other nationalities. Uh, I should say black and brown people are uh, are dying from this. Uh, there's that social stigma that is associated with that as well. And I guess like we did with, uh, with AIDS, it's a matter of educating the public uh, to, you know, to get them to understand that, um, you know, obviously you're dealing with something that you cannot see. Um, and the fact that it may have a, a higher prevalence of, of a uh, mortality rate in one population uh, does not mean that everyone that you see, uh, you know, has that, uh, you know, just, it's just blatant discrimination. Or for someone who may be of Asian descent, uh, you know, we've heard stories of them being spit on or that they're being um, uh, actually hit uh, or told to go back to where they came from. You know, all this stuff sort of sounds, sounds familiar. Uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it is something that we have to be aware of. And I think from a um, uh, religious perspective, uh, one, you got to be prepared to offer counseling to individuals because it's, it's enough that, uh, you know, you, you may be feeling uh, discriminated against because of, you know, who you are or who you may love or any other pre-existing conditions that you may have. And now to have this, you know, put on top of that, uh, you know, can be very, very uh, disheartening. So I think one of the things that 
those of us in the uh, religious community need to be prepared for is how to do uh, counseling uh, you know, for these individuals to uh, let them know that they do have a self-worth and that it's the other person's problem, not, you know, not theirs. Uh, and also be prepared to, if, if necessary, uh, you know, take action. I mean, you know, we do not, uh, you know, tolerate discrimination, uh, you know, in this country. And, uh, you know, there are laws that, uh, you know, that are there to protect individuals for that. And uh, again, I think it's just a matter of educating the public uh, to, uh, to understand, uh, you know, sometimes people read uh, or gather information from, uh, from sites that are not accurate in their uh, portrayal of what is going on. You know, we, we all know that uh, sometimes people will skew things to make it beneficial for them, and we need to be aware of that. And it's our job, I think, as, as Christians to put a stop to the further uh, spreading of those um, miscommunications or rumors or or um, uh, uh, other things that, that are out there that are not true. You really want people to uh, to to know and understand the facts, and uh, and that's what we need to uh, to work with. Even though you may have people who don't believe in science or don't believe that uh, you know what uh, you know what scientists and uh, you know and other people are are saying about this virus. It does create quite a, a problem and a challenge, uh, but the, the main thing is making sure that the truth is gotten out there and not these, um, you know, these misconceptions. And uh, David, I don't know if you have anything else that you'd like to add to that, but... Uh, um, I think the only thing I'd add to that is that on, unlike HIV and AIDS, the good news is that this is not, there's no sin attached to this one. There's no more cause attached to this disease. It's great equalizer. It goes, it goes after prime ministers, heads of states, Hollywood stars, to the humblest of per, person. Absolutely. And that I'm thankful for that we don't have that whole, I call it the morality clause of yes. whether you're gay, high drug user, and this is God's retribution on mm -hmm. you. Plus it's taken out a few um, passes as well. Those, mm -hmm. And it goes, uh, faith without action, yeah, um, it's all. It's a good example here where you needed to have faith, but you needed to have some action. And you know, as the scriptures I quoted earlier, to have the self-discipline to realize that, yeah, well, I probably need to take um, heed of the steps. Mm -hmm. And the advisor of to socially distance myself, not to be basically going into large groups of people and gathering large groups of people because you not only endanger yourself but you endanger the lives of others also. So mm -hmm. as pastors or religious leaders, we have to be very cognizant of what we mm -hmm. think we're being called to do. Yes. I would just like to add uh, two other things. I'm sorry, Vance, to yes. you know, uh, But two other things along those lines. I think it's also very important that we understand the culture of the individual, where they may be coming from, and how um, you know, perhaps some perceived discrimination or whatever may be um, uh, uh, accepted or, un, or, or or dealt with in the various cultures that we may see. Uh, so it's very important that we, you know, we have a pretty good understanding of, you know, if it is someone, say, from the Asian uh, uh, community or someone from the African American community or Hispanic community, those are going to be viewed differently. Um, but, uh, you know, so we need to know that in order to be able to help that individual and walk them down that path uh, to where you know they uh, you know they feel whole, so to speak. And also, this may also cause them to have, um, I guess, to uh, either a crisis of faith or question their faith mm -hmm. as well. And I think um, you know, as ministers and, and Christians, we need to be uh, ready to you know to to tackle those uh, particular aspects of that as well. Uh, not only is it going to be, you know, why me, or, you know, I, I may have all these other illnesses, uh, you know, on top of this, you know, uh, you know, why is God doing this to me, or, you know, things of this sort, and to get them to understand that, um, you know, this isn't, uh, you know, this isn't an act of God, um, you know, punishing you for who you are, or, or, you know, uh, or, or what you believe, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, again, the full education of where this uh, where this virus comes from, how it acts, and you know things of this sort 
are the, uh, the you know the things that the person needs to understand and also understand how to uh, perhaps turn this around uh, and and make some good out of it. You know, I had mentioned earlier that I know at least three young people who have been struck by this virus, and they they've had a full recovery, uh, and they are nurses. So what are they doing? They're taking the positive spin and are doing um, uh, webinars or you know their own Facebook or whatever else, explaining to their colleagues what it was like for them to experience this and to be on the other side, to be cared for by your you know, colleagues that you know, or, and yeah, and that sort of puts a, a whole different spin on things because when you're in healthcare, and I'm sure David can probably uh, uh, echo this, uh, uh, I know the few times that I've been sick or maybe have been hospitalized or whatever, your mind just starts running because you start thinking, well, what if it's this? What if it's that? Or, you know, you begin to think of all these tests and things like that. And, you know, uh, it's like uh, they say um, uh, about a lawyer, you know, uh, a lawyer who represents himself as a fool. <laughs> I don't want to say that a, a member of the healthcare that does yeah, it, yeah. but it's, it's just a natural instinct, though. You're going to be, you know, it is, uh, you know, hard to, to not begin to, to think of what you know. And, uh, you know, you're beginning to you know, perhaps get a, a picture for yourself. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought uh, up all of that up. Um, one of the things I, I did want to point out is that we had uh, in conversation with uh, Reverend Kamendu and uh, Matito Ande Kenya, uh, one of the things he is faced with with his uh, community uh, is uh, a large belief that this virus is brought on because of something that they have done as a people or that someone has done. And so uh, that is something he acknowledged that he's having to face and, and so um, we'll be in communication with him more about what what education or, or abilities we have uh, as a, a global uh, ministry with um, with not only MCC but interfaith uh, services as well to be able to reach out and, and make sure he's equipped with the things he needs to be able to help guide his people through that. Um, I think it's uh, it, it's really important that you that you do that because we are seeing little pockets of of uh, you know some religious sects that are saying this is God's punishment to man and et cetera. And it's stuff like that that can really work on the person's you know, psych and mental health uh, you know, uh, along those lines. So, um, so we've got to be prepared to come back uh, you know, against those individuals mm -hmm. uh, because you know, they do sometimes will, uh, will think that what I'm saying is right. Uh, you know, it's morally right, and you know, and until you, um, you know, uh, do right and what right may be in their eyes, um, you know, then you know they're going to continue to pre perceive this as God's punishment. Uh, you know, for something that you may have done, something immoral or or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and you know, I'm sorry, but the God I serve does not, you know, yeah. not do yeah. that. <laughs> And one to add to that, yeah, I'll be happy to work with uh, Michael because I'm down in that neck of the woods on a regular basis, also down in Africa. Yes. Yeah, then South Africa. And he's a hop, skip, and a jump from either Uganda or Rwanda for me when I get down there to go talk with him, yeah. or talk with him some more too. But one of the other things that we all should be aware of is that this pandemic, COVID 19, is not the first pandemic that we have hit as. Our species. Mm -hmm. had back the Saint Cyprian, back way back in um, 250 AD, where mm -hmm. it, I would think it may have been measles or pox, smallpox, and then a hundred years later, Antonine it was smallpox, and we have had the plague, the Spanish flu, and more recently, mm -hmm. Ebola. All of these are all viruses, but even something more pertinent today is HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. HIV to be exact. HIV is a pandemic that has become endemic in the sense that we haven't eliminated the virus, we have just learned to live with it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is not the first, it's not the first rodeo as I should, as you would say. Yes. <laughs> um, one of the other things that, that you hit on, and we've hit on a couple of times here, um, and, and just to, to circle back to it briefly, is uh, looking at the way that this is. It is an equal opportunity uh, virus in that uh, anybody can contract it, um, and it's not discriminatory in that. But I do believe that it has shown, at least in the studies we're seeing start to come out, uh, that it is disproportionately impacting certain groups of people, particularly black communities and Hispanic communities. When we looked at the numbers from New York City, 
Um, New York City was reporting that 34% uh, of their death rate uh, was from the Hispanic community uh, as, and 28% from the black community and those communities only made up 28 or 29 and 22% of the population. Um, and then we see that, uh, you know, just tripled in, in Louisiana where 70% of the deaths are uh, from the black community and that only makes up 32% of their total population. So can you speak to a little bit more about why you think this is? I know we talked about a little bit of the comorbid, uh, comorbidities, but why it is those uh, populations are being impacted so severely, so disproportionately by COVID? Okay. From about my experience here in New Jersey is that one, you have to look about the comorbidities and then you also have to look at the urban environment that folks live. The people are living closer together here in the Northeast and even on in Louisiana in a lot of these places. That's two. And three, access to healthcare, how often that you actually follow up with your healthcare provider. In because a lot of folks do not get the opportunity to go to the doctor when they're sick. Or even if they're sick, they said, well, I, I'll find it off. And they only show up in the ER. Mm. They are critical. And that's even with um, health care, health in insurance. A lot of times they show up in the ER and you look at them, their blood pressure is over the 200s, the blood sugars um, in the 400, 500, 600 range. They're having a severe asthmatic attack and you're just like, how do you get this way? Because there's not that continuous um, medical follow-up or continual medical care to keep this in check. So add that comorbidity, close proximity to your neighbors and your transport systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have a perfect storm just brewing around and it just explodes when something like this hits. Mm -hmm. I would also add to that too, that uh, um, one, there's also the, the distrust of healthcare um, yes. uh, in, in both those cultures that you uh, identified. And I would also add probably the, uh, the Asian uh, culture as well, uh, or, or seeking alternatives uh, to what we think of as, as Western medicine or, or modern medicine as well. Um, and so uh, as a result of that, <clears throat> you know, um, Illnesses that could be identified early and prevented or, you know, worked on, uh, you know, it's not until they do, as David says, show up in the emergency room that, um, you know, with the blood pressure, of, you know, maybe 170 over 110 and just waiting to have a stroke. Uh, whereas had that been, you know, had they sought, uh, you know, healthcare all along, um, that could have been perhaps, uh, you know, taken care of with diet, exercise, and maybe a, you know, 25 cent a day pill, uh, you know, and with, you know, with careful monitoring. But because there is this distrust or because they feel, well, I've got to work, <laughs> you know, and I got to put food on the table. So, you know, you, you have to weigh those um, you know, the, those consequences. So we need to work out ways that um, we can ensure that healthcare is brought into those communities on some, you know, some basis, uh, you know, and recognize that, okay, we can't just all have healthcare Monday through Friday from eight to, you know, to five or six or seven. Maybe we need to have, you know, evening clinics that will run till nine, 10, 11 o'clock at night uh, so that they, it does allow that individual to go and work their eight or 10 hour shift, but then, you know, also still get uh, access to healthcare as well. And, you know, and you'd mentioned prior to the beginning of this, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, not having proper insurance as well, you know, where universal health care, uh, you know, could possibly, you know, help uh, along this, this line as well to ensure that um, <clears throat> things are in place to where, um, you know, uh, there's not that struggling need or in the mind of the individual, um, you know, yes, I need uh, insurance, but it's so expensive that I, I have to go without it in order to put food on the table, pay my bills and et cetera. Uh, you know, something like insurance will be considered a luxury or to be able mm -hmm. to purchase insurance is considered a luxury. So they forego that, you know, taking this gamble and because I made it through this day or yesterday or the day before and nothing happened, they really don't see the, you know, the tangible benefits of being able to, to be insured uh, mm -hmm. until it's too late. And, and when it hits, then 
uh, you know, that's when perhaps they may be wishing, well, I wish we had, you know, we had insurance or whatever else. This is where, again, with uh, perhaps universal health care uh, would be able to, you know, to help uh, knock away one of those barriers, if you will, so that individuals would be able to, uh, to have good access to, uh, you know, to, to proper health care. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and we, we may have to circle back and do another conversation just on some of that, because I think that that opens up so many questions that I really want to uh, dig into. Um, I think we did want to, to talk uh, a bit on some of the mental health issues that we're seeing um, today or that we may be faced with. Um, so I, and I know you guys had a few things you wanted to share with us on that, uh, if you will. Well, I, I think David, since you're on the front line uh, uh, more so than than I am, perhaps you want to uh, address it from the perspective of the uh, healthcare provider, and and then you can talk about the patient in general. From the healthcare provider standpoint, uh, where the mental health issues come in, it's not that it's there's none because pretty much you have. I know because we are the second highest. Of impacted state, you know, in in the U.S., they just keep coming. It's just this continuous wave. It just doesn't stop. Because now at that point, you keep going. You test uh, when the tested, they come in, and most times when they show up, they don't show up. Um, you, very rarely do I come across an asymptomatic person. Mm. The person that shows up is the ones that has self quarantined or they even realize that they had it and they come in and they present with oxygen levels that you didn't think was possible for life. And then you're now trying to mitigate the ways of how you treat them. Do they get enough oxygen? Do you put them on a ventilator and stuff like that? And then you, it just keeps going. Then you start worrying about when you leave here, every time somebody comes in, you now have to have PPE up and then you think about your colleagues who have died or got infected and it's like, okay, here I go again. It feels like sometimes you're rolling the dice. Mm -hmm. You get done with it. You get long hours, little sleep. The, you don't eat properly. I admit that. And not, and the good thing about it is that with this McDonald's and Burger King is not easily accessible. So you have what you can, when you can. And that's basically, and what the stress of it all, because you feel helpless because you're trying to heal. And at the same time, it feels like you're like just a cog in the machinery going through because a lot of us don't get to see the person being discharged. Mm -hmm. at the end. And there's so few of them along the way that you see them because you go on and you see people on a ventilator for two, three weeks you know, think to yourself, this is un not sustainable. And you just feel helpless. And you look at the young folks that come in, 24 year old, about a 24 year old, a 30 year old. Then you look at the older folks who are in a nursing home minding their own business. And here comes this entire thing that takes out all of their, their social networks, their friends, et cetera. And they come in scared because, and now they come in without any friends or family, and you have to now become that surrogate family, whether you want to or not. Whatever barriers or mental um, barriers you had, basically defenses you put up to protect yourself that you can do your job, mm -hmm. wrote it away, and then you're left with standing in a place like, what, what next? Mm -hmm. Dr. Williams, what, what do you say to healthcare providers um, and, and even yourself, maybe if you want to share some of your own self-care techniques, I hope you're, you're doing that. Because what you're describing sounds like a recipe for disaster. You, you, you're not eating properly or you're not able to eat properly. You're not able to get rest. You're constantly in a heightened level of stress. And so all of the things that we know that, that make our immune system uh, systems weakened you're describing is what our healthcare professionals are going through and then added on top of the fact that they are faced with uh, being right in the front lines of, of the virus um, and sometimes challenged whether or not they're even going to have the right PPE to be able to defend themselves. So what do 
what do healthcare providers do to help care for themselves? And then what can we as a community do uh, to help care for our healthcare providers? A lot of have been um, going on little survival mode. It's you get done with you get done working, and for me, the biggest thing I'm thinking of like I need to get some sleep. So that's your overriding fact. Whatever feelings you have, etc. Some folks. Um, You'll find, you'll find some folks go away for a while. Um, they go sit in a closet and cry. Some people go yell out at, at the moon. But a lot of times, in ter for me, it's, I've been through this so often before, either during active duty, during combat situation, or working in places where this death is a constant. And I don't know if I've become, I have not become immune to it. It's... The only thing I can say, faith is what gets me through because at the same time in all of this, I still try to basically make, um, prepare for our service for my congregation and to keep them going because you still have to see people are scared. You shelter in place. The big scary virus is out to get you. So what gets keeps me going is faith. And then I have some friends who basically called me and was like, okay, how are you doing? What are you doing? And so forth. My neighbors, when I get home for the most part, they w watch out for me, etc. The other day I got home, my neighbor's like, oh, you, have, you haven't had dinner yet, right, doc? I'm like, no. I was like, okay, what am I going? I was thinking about cornflakes actually for dinner that night. My doorbell rang and they had, they made dinner for me, but that's how I get through. But a lot of other folks, you know, they have on their minds, their families. They don't want to give it to them. So a lot of them haven't seen their families. They have isolated themselves either in the garage, in a tent and a sleeping bag on a cot or in our dorms. Here we have dorms at the Rutgers University dorms that some folks are staying, some people are staying in hotels, etc but they just don't want to bring this home to, so that added stress. But to answer your question, there's not a lot doing because the thing is, particularly in critical care, mm -hmm. you go, you get through it. Come what me, by any means necessary, you get through it. Deal with it later on if you can. Well, I would just, just like to add uh, to that is, uh, well, first of all, we know that as uh, healthcare workers are under all this stress, they get tired, they get very fatigued. And as a result of that, there's an increased chance for uh, errors. And mm -hmm. uh, so you do want to um, try to stress in their minds to recognize when they are um, you know, that way and to do something about it. Or if you happen to see a, a colleague that is that way, even if it's just you know, tapping them on the shoulder and say, hey, take 15 minutes and, you know, go go rest or get yourself a candy bar or, you know, go outside or do something, um, you know, something to, you know, to, to break the strain. And, you know, they need to understand how important it is to be resilient and uh, be able to, uh, you know, to uh, recognize that, you know, maybe I need help. If you've, you know, if you've worked, you know, um, you know, six or seven days in a row, uh, you know, especially 10, 12 hour shifts or, you know, something like that, that's, uh, you know, that's asking quite a lot. And um, uh, again, it's, it's not going to do you any good if you are sick, because that's what's going to happen in the end is that, you know, your body is going to take on this toll and it's going to come out in some way, either um, mental fatigue, exhaustion, uh, or you begin to show, you know, these other things as we've talked about, you know, the hypertension, the uh, maybe, uh, you know, diabetes, the, you know, the prolonged stress that you're under, uh, you know, is, uh, is going to take its effect. So we really need to be able to, um, you know, to, to recognize that, hey, I need a break. And, you know, what are some of the things you can do, even if it's, you know, uh, you know, going for a walk on the beach or, uh, you know, doing something to, uh, you know, to get away from that so that uh, you're not, uh, under all that stress and strain is uh, extremely important. 
and there are or talk to someone as well you know being able to you know normally we may see you know one or two deaths a month on a unit now you're seeing you know three four five deaths a shift if not more you know that's got its toll as well um and uh so being able to talk with someone and recognizing that uh, you know, there's no shame in doing that either uh, as a counselor or you know, your pastor or, you know, psychiatrist or, or someone, uh, you know, but recognize that, uh, you know, hey, I need to talk to someone and, um, you know, and make sure that you, you know, you, you do that. So. Well, we are um, at the hour mark. We've been going for an hour and we've tried to, to keep these conversations to an hour to be cognizant of everybody's time. So um, and we do want to, to wrap up and, and uh, maybe we can circle back and, and, and have some more conversation on some of these issues because there's so many things that I think we uh, need to make sure that we get out there. Um, are there any last things that you want to share with folks before we uh, wrap up? Yeah, well, I think all of our mental health issues, we just need to talk about folks sheltering in place. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about cabin fever, but also the folks um, that a lot of folks who live by themselves, that loneliness, because work, church, and all of these social organizations were where they had the social contacts. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, these are cut off. So if you know anybody that lives by themselves, check in on them, see how they're doing, et cetera. And even if with you, you got tired, you had the kids home, you got the dog running crazy, the fever thing, find ways to break up the monotony as such. Mm -hmm. The key things along the, along the way. And I think there, yes, there's a lot more that we could talk about, but we're probably, that's another conversation for another. <laughs> well, I would just yeah. add uh, two, two quick points to that uh, as well. Um, you know, as David had mentioned, uh, you know, staying home, uh, and your uh, the viewers will probably be familiar with the the signs that they've seen healthcare workers say, you know, we stay at work so you can you know stay at home, uh, you know, you know, just recognize the importance. I, I know it's asking a lot for them to do that, but that means as long as they're staying home or within their environment, they're decreasing the chance that they may get this virus and therefore become one of the statistics that. Uh, uh, you know, so it just continues. If you reflect back to what, uh, uh, you know, to what David had talked about when he talked about the reproductive ratio, uh, you know, don't become part of that. The other thing is those little random act of kindness, like, um, uh, like David had talked about with his, uh, his next door neighbor bringing over a meal. Or if you do know of a uh, healthcare worker in your community, uh, yeah, check on their family members if they're there too, because they're under a lot of stress. Or you know, offer to uh, you know to look after their their dog, their cat, or you know something while they are 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 working. Something that will take their mind off of worrying while they are at work. Uh, you know, those little acts of kindness go a very very long way. So that's that's what I would add to that. Well, thank you both so much. Um, we certainly want to acknowledge the extraordinary work um, and courage that our healthcare uh, uh, workers have. Uh, particularly during this time, and and um, it just I stand in awe at what folks go through um, on a day in and day out basis. And talking to Dr. Williams some, and uh, hearing some of the stories uh, of just how what they're faced with. Um, and so I think we have to acknowledge that, and we thank you for your leadership for both of you. Uh, thank you for the work that you are doing to help be there for our healthcare workers, and, and Dr. Williams for what you're doing every day on the front lines in the hospital. Um, and, and being there to help. Um, and, and, you know, that switching back and forth uh, between the role of pastor and the role of doctor, um, that, that's just extraordinary to me to, to think about what you're doing there. And um, so we, we certainly acknowledge what uh, healthcare is doing for us right now and, and how you know, we won't find many ways to support. Uh, we'll put some links up uh, after this for some ways that we know uh, locally that you can do that and across the nation as we know those uh, just to, to show ways. But I think the, the biggest takeaway from this, at least for me, for right now, what we can do right now is be there for one another, uh, be there for, for each other, support one another, call one another. Um, if we know healthcare workers, I think most of us at this point in our lives do know somebody who works in healthcare. So call them uh, or text them and let them know, find out what we can do for you. 
Um, so thank you again both for being here this morning with us. Uh, I certainly thank you for taking time to, to call uh, or join the call. Um, and, and we'll, we'll conclude uh, or, or have more conversation um, around these topics as we need to, to get information out there. So thank you again for being here uh, and, and stay safe. God uh, be with you. We are praying for both of you and for everyone that's charged in your care. Um, and let us know if there's anything we can do for either of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.